Well, thank you all for joining us for tonight's webinar, The Science of Shrimp. This is the third of a four-part series exploring the science behind food. I'm Greg Berry, Assistant Director in the UAB Office of Alumni Affairs. Just a quick note, since this is a virtual event, don't be surprised if something seems out of place or a technical issue pop up. If you have any issues with your video or audio dropping or freezing, click the reconnect button at the top of your screen. This will get you back to the webinar right away. There is more to shrimp than being a common hors d'oeuvre. Did you know that it's a multi-billion, with a B, multi-billion dollar industry? Tonight we'll explore how new technologies right here at UAB will not only make shrimp culture efficient, but can be used to improve behavior. But before we introduce tonight's guest, I would like to ask everybody a question. So what is your favorite kind of shrimp? We're channeling our inner Forrest Gump or Bubba on this one. You should see on your screen a list of options that you can choose from and you can pick from popcorn shrimp, shrimp and grits, or even bacon wrapped shrimp, which may be my favorite kind of shrimp. Choose your favorite from the list. We're gonna go ahead and keep that poll up for a few moments. If you have any questions during tonight's presentation, please drop them in the chat. Uh, I will make sure that Dr. Watts has the opportunity to answer those questions after his presentation. I'm gonna go ahead and keep that poll up just a little bit more. What is your favorite kind of shrimp? And yes, it might not be on the list, but there's so many different things you can do with shrimp. And I see a whole lot of jockeying around and I'm gonna go ahead and, and call it right now. Shrimp Scampi is kind of taking the lead. 40% of our audience thinks that shrimp scampi, or it says that shrimp scampi is their favorite kind of shrimp. So thank you so much for participating in tonight's poll. At this time, I would like to introduce tonight's guest. Dr. Stephen Watts completed his MS and PhD from the University of South Florida in 1986. He received an international postdoc in aquatic animal reproduction and studied at the University of New Hampshire, the State University of Altrecht, uh, Altrek, the Netherlands, and I'm probably saying that wrong, Dr. Watts, I apologize, as well as University of Victoria, Canada. He has been a faculty in the Department of Biology at UAB for the past 34 years. And as we kick things off, I'm going to go ahead and play a video. Dr. Watts, if you can mute, I'm going to go ahead and mute during this so we don't get feedback. And this just is a kind of a retrospect of, of where we've been. Deep inside an aquatic laboratory on UAB's campus, Professor Steve Watts and his team have found a better way to grow shrimp using, well, droppings from sea urchins. In some cases, we had our shrimp together with our sea urchins. They interacted very well, and we noticed that the shrimp had a tendency to congregate around the sea urchins and would sometimes consume the waste pellets that came from these sea urchins. So it looked like that there might be some type of synergy there. That synergy started with these sea urchin pellets, which are full of healthy bacteria and help the shrimp grow faster and larger than they would when consuming top of the line shrimp food. You do not have to use shrimp feed to grow these shrimp when you have urchins present. Worldwide, most of the shrimp that we're going to consume is grown in ponds. Not so much of it is caught in the ocean anymore. When it's grown in ponds, they usually produce some type of shrimp feed, and this can be quite expensive. These are billion dollar industries. Growing shrimp in a polyculture system when one animal supports another without needing feed at all could revolutionize the development of aquaculture. What surprised us was not only did they grow, they grew very well. In an aquaculture system, food accounts for about 60% of the total cost of growing the animals. By eliminating the need for traditional food, Everyone benefits, but how do they taste? To evaluate their worth to the restaurant industry, Watts' team brought the sea urchin-grown shrimp to world-renowned chef Chris Hastings at Birmingham's Hot and Hot Fish Club. We needed his sophisticated palate to look at the shrimp that we have been rearing in with the sea urchins. Obviously, a large shrimp is very notable, but a large shrimp that tastes really good is going to be far more important to us. This is kind of for me, this is this is the stuff I spend my entire life searching out is the very finest ingredients. Moments like these are the kind of the most exciting thing I do. Because I know but it, you know what it means for me as a chef? I know that I have a hope and, uh, and a chance to achieve what we dream in terms of cooking. You can't you can't um, 
you can't achieve those dreams with less than perfect product. Based on the flavor alone, Foss's shrimp is, passed really, Chef so Hastings' taste test. Whatever the diet is that you're feeding these shrimp, I, I, I'll totally approve. But supporting sustainable aquaculture that tastes good and is healthy was an even larger goal for this project. I'm telling you, if you do a side-by-side -side with any shrimp grown in a pond in the world, you know, that's not done sustainably in a closed loop with organic, you know, uh, food as its, uh, as its source in a clean, healthy environment, and you taste it next to your shrimp, it, you can, the, the, the flavor, the texture, um, uh, everything about your shrimp is world-class compared to that. You should be very proud of this. We all know the world needs more protein. Absolutely. The seas cannot support overfishing. As Watts' team continues to build on the success of this research, they'll look to expand to other aquatic species. With the number of individuals in this world increasing and the need for protein, aquaculture is going to be the only mechanism by which we are going to be able to enhance fish protein production. It's all we have. So with that, I would like to turn things over to Dr. Watts. Thank you so much for being a part of tonight's webinar and the platform's yours. Oh, since I had you mute, I gotta have you unmute first. My mistake. No, you are all good. Very good. Well, thank you, Greg. And I appreciate the invitation of the Alumni Society to talk a little bit about some of the research we have going on. I wanted to show that video first. Uh, just to kind of let you know the punchline of the story I would like to tell tonight. But what I really like to do is introduce you to that story through some of our previous work, talk a little bit about the shrimp, and then tell you where we're going from there. Now, what we were doing where by co-culturing shrimp with urchins is really called Integrative Multitrophic Aquaculture, or IMTA. I know that's a mouthful, but that's basically when two or more organisms are going to be farmed together. Now, this is an example of what I'm talking about. If you see this fish, this fish can be fed a pellet. That fish consumes the pellet and will produce waste material, either some type of nitrogen waste or some types of pelleted waste, solid waste. Basically, that waste now becomes the food for what we call an extractive species. The fish was the fed species. The mussels or the algae becomes the extractive species. So this is really important and, and there's a lot of positive benefits that come from IMTA. Just to name a few of them, it will reduce cost overall. It's a more efficient use of the water. It reduces feeds, increases yields, it will absolutely reduce runoff and such because we are, some of that is being taken up as a food source. And then there's the market viability. Basically, there are more products that one can sell. Let me first start by telling you a little bit about what we've been doing with sea urchins over the years. And we've been working with this since I've been here at UAB. This is Lytokinus variegatus. It's the Gulf of Mexico sea urchin is found in the Atlantic. It's found throughout the Caribbean. It is found all the way to Brazil. So we are very interested in the biology of this particular organism and learning more about it. Uh, it fits in with a group of other common sea urchins that are found in all of the oceans across the world. And several of these are commercially very important. At least four of these six that I have up here now are consumed as a food item. Basically you eat the roe or what in Japan they refer to as the uni. And so this would be consumed and uh, uh, people like it. As a matter of fact, let's take a look at the what this product looks like. If you take these sea urchins and you open them, you can see that there are five gonads and you can see those gonads, one, two, three, four, five, inside any one of these urchins. That is the part that we eat. The flavor of these, in my opinion, is outstanding. It's an umami type of characteristic that gives a very savory flavor. And of course, we see this in sushi all the time. Uh, here we have some, some of these gonads in a bowl. We have some served with salmon roll and such. And if we look further, here's a nice plate that actually would probably retail for about $500 at an at appropriate restaurant. So uh, it's a delicacy. 
it's in high demand. It's also expensive. Uh, the cheapest I can see this stuff is around $40 a pound, and I've seen it up to $500 a pound as well. Now, to collect sea urchins or to harvest them, it's all done by hand. Very little machine harvesting is done. Boats go out, usually under specific permits, and they can hand collect these sea urchins. They bring them back, uh, and are, at that point in time, they're ready to be either, either processed or simply sold live to uh, markets, many of which are overseas. For our urchin, we actually like to collect them ourselves down at the Gulf of Mexico. Port St. Joe, which is uh, near Cape San Blas, is one of our favorite places to go. There's a rich and lush seagrass community there. You can see the ocean here in the background and you can take a look at what some of these urchins look like when they're pretty much within the thalassia beds. I'll let you know that I have a large number of students that work in our laboratories and it seems that every time we go to the coast, to do an urchin collection, I have no trouble whatsoever getting people to come along for the trip. Now in our laboratory, we oftentimes make our own urchins. We don't just go collect them, we can make them from scratch. Basically, we can take a broodstock urchin that you see here in this finger bowl, and we can inject it with a solution. We usually use potassium chloride. It doesn't hurt the urchin but it causes their gonads to basically contract, the muscles to contract. And this urchin here will now express either sperm or eggs. We can mix those together. And when we do, voila, we have embryos. The embryos immediately start to develop and they will develop into a series of larval stages that we can track over a period of about two to three weeks. They start with a small prism and they simply increase in their uh, size and in their complexity up to the point where they're competent. Here's a nice photograph of the Lytokinus pluteus. It's actually a beautiful organism. It's about a millimeter in length and we think it's something really, really neat to, uh, just to look at. There are numerous cilia around the arms of these animals and what they will do is simply bring in microscopic foods like microalgae and such. It'll go into the stomach that you see right here and they grow on to become competent. To feed these animals, we also raise microalgae. You can see several different species of microalgae here in our incubators and such. Uh, and that gets them to the point where we eventually end up with baby urchins. These urchins are around a half of a millimeter, less than a half or less than a half a millimeter in size when they are metamorphosed, when that larvae that you saw inverts itself, it will become a sea urchin of incredibly small size. We then grow these on diatalum films, and at some point in time, we end up with a whole bunch of urchins. Here you see a dime inside of a finger bowl and all of these baby urchins that are growing around it. As these urchins get bigger, and these ones you see here are less than a half an inch in diameter, about a centimeter or so, we begin to feed them some of our green biofilms that we culture there in the laboratory. And the urchins love to eat this and munch on it. They have good color. They have a healthy appetite. They do quite well. And ultimately, we get old enough to where we can start to feed them a prepared feed. Now, this is one of the projects we worked on for a number of years. We take various ingredients so that we can have a complete diet. That is complete in terms of the amount of protein, the lipids, the carbohydrates, the minerals, the vitamins. All of these components are mixed together and extruded into what looks like a long strand. We take these strands, we can dry them out here. You can see them on several of our boards. We dry them out and it ends up looking like dried spaghetti, a long dry sp spaghetti. We then package these up and we can use these various uh, various formulations. We can change protein, we can change lipid, we can change vitamins, whatever component we want to change and then look at the ensuing effects on the urchin as it moves forward and grows. Ultimately, this is what we're after. This is the lytokinus that we've been growing for some time. We opened up the top portion of it so that you could look down and see the actual gonad. And this is the part that people want to eat. Again, you see five gonads here. And if I move forward, 
you'll see what we refer to as a sea urchin tongue. Again, it's oftentimes called a tongue, like your tongue. And you can look at this gonad and see immediately why it's called a tongue, because it has a lot of the same phenotype that we would see within a tongue. Now, sometimes we have to have the technicians help us create some of these feeds uh, and work in the laboratory. Actually, I'm teasing right here. That's not a technician. That's Andrew Zimmern who found out about our uh, sea urchin uh, work that we had going on and came in and filmed the show. And I hope a lot of you have probably seen Birmingham, the New South, which was a, a documentary about a lot of the good foods that are going on here in Birmingham. And we were lucky enough or fortunate enough to be one of the, one of the, uh, uh, pro, one of the part of one of the programs that they were able to show. So it was fun to talk with these guys. They really appreciated the work we were doing and I was happy that Andrew thought that the taste and the flavor of the sea urchins was outstanding. Now, obviously we're trying to grow these sea urchins to, to get a seafood product, a value-added seafood product that has some commercial value. Are there other applications from our work that are important based on our work with sea urchins? Well, let's see. This is a issue of science a few years back in which the genome of the sea urchin had been fully determined. This is really important because the embryo of the sea urchin, in particular our sea urchin, is almost identical in development to that of the human embryo. Obviously there are ethical concerns with doing any work with human embryos, but with sea urchin embryos, which are so much like the human embryos, you can work with these by the millions. This particular, our particular urchin, as well as a few other urchins in the world now are, are renowned for their value in developmental biology and a lot of gene editing techniques are being developed at this point in time so that we can look at the fate of cells as they develop and this will lead us to different uh, different abilities to, uh, to uh, uh, alter genes in the future this has great application if you're looking at human disease uh, or human genetic issues as well. Another project that we're working on now is co-culturing sea urchins with oysters. Uh, about a year or so ago, we were contacted by some of the oyster farmers who wanted to culture sea urchins with their oysters. And let me go through this just a little bit. Oysters in the old days were simply raked from the bottom by fishermen with specific rakes, hauled above, put in baskets or sacks, sent off to the restaurant, and there you ate your oysters. Almost no oysters are farmed like that for the most part anymore. Now if you were to go through the Gulf of Mexico, particularly the west coast of Florida, you would see thousands and thousands of cages. These are floating cages. They have baskets in them. They're usually three to six foot in length. Uh, the baskets contain numerous oysters within them. Uh, a lot of boats can take these, these oysters in these baskets out. The oysters will start at about a centimeter in length and they'll grow them over a period of months until they're about two and a half to three inches long, the eaten size. Well, there's a problem with when you put cages out into the ocean. They immediately foul, they biofoul. They get material growing all over them. And after a while, the material grows on the basket, it grows on the oyster and such, and it becomes a bit of a nuisance as well as a problem. It has to be scrubbed, it has to be removed. Well, urchins like that fouling material. So we started putting urchins in with the cages that were growing the oysters. Look what happens here, particularly in this upper right-hand panel. When we have urchins in this particular cage, they clean the urchins. They eat all of the components off of it. That's a highly desirable or the, the urchins have cleaned the oyster. It's highly desirable. It's ready to go to market at this point in time. If you look at, at the bottom component, on the bottom one, this would be a oyster that the urchins were not, did not have availability to, to consume any of, these, um, any of these living organisms that are on the shell. This is gonna have to be clean. That takes time, effort, and money. So not only did they clean the oysters, the oysters were bigger, they had more meat in them as well. 
the cages stayed relatively clean, allowing water flow to go through there. So there is an incredible amount of excitement in the Gulf of Mexico right now for the co-culture of sea urchins with these oysters. And by the way, that's a second pro that's a second product, a second aquaculture product that we can have ha if the urchins are then also sold as well. Of course, one of the most fun things that I get a chance to do is since we work with a lot of aquaculture products, we get a chance to meet a lot of chefs like Chef Hastings here in Birmingham, Alabama. We've been able to meet other chefs and such, and I've got a chance to, to, to talk with these individuals and work with them. We're all interested in sustainable aquaculture, and uh, they've really shown me how to cook or, or, or how to eat good foods uh, that they prepare at their various restaurants. So that's a lot of fun and a highlight of some of the work we do. Now, let's get back to our story. Sea urchins and shrimp, putting them together. We first did this, I would say, about 15 years ago at the University of Texas A&M, where we were doing some work over there with a colleague of mine, Dr. Addison Lawrence. He has a phenomenal or had a phenomenal shrimp mariculture facility. And we brought the sea urchins over there just to work with the sea urchins, not to work with the shrimp, but just to work with the sea urchins. We put them together in the same container in the same raceways and such and thought everything's going to be fine. The shrimp can move fast. The urchins, you're lucky if they can move a couple centimeters in a few minutes. You know, they're not going to win any track races there. So we didn't worry about them. As it turned out, you come back the next day and your shrimp start disappearing. What would happen is a shrimp would basically fall asleep, if you will, on the bottom. The urchins would crawl around the shrimp and trap it with those spines. And then they would simply move in on it and eat it alive. Sea urchins like sushi as well. So we knew at that point in time that we're not gonna be able to put these two together in any type of culture situation. However, we made some interesting observations then. The shrimp seemed to like the egesta, and basically that's basically the poo that comes out of these sea urchins. The shrimp like to eat these little pellets, and I'll tell you a little bit more about these pellets in just a minute or so. But the shrimp like to eat them, and it became clear to us that maybe there's a benefit to the shrimp from eating these. Maybe they just liked them. Maybe it was like an M&M candy, and, but they would consume these components. Well, first, let me tell you just a little bit more about the shrimp we're actually working with, and then we'll put the two together. This is the Little Panaeus vanami, or vanami, as some people would refer to it is. It's the Pacific white shrimp. It's a beautiful organism that grows very rapidly uh, you can take these things from the size of uh, from the size of the ballpoint pen up to a 30 gram edible large animal in about 120 days. So it's an excellent animal to work with. The Pacific shrimp, this is how you're used to seeing it pretty much. Shrimp cocktails, shrimp on a stick, shrimp on pizza, shrimp on a, a lot of different things, so to speak. It's a very healthy it's a very healthy seafood, lots of protein, a low amount of fat. Uh, by, all, by all accounts, this is a really good seafood to eat. Now, shrimp is cultured extensively throughout the world. In fact, if you look at this upper panel right here, you'll see we're now approaching 5 million metric tons of shrimp cultured per year in the world. Five million metric tons. Most of those are the Vanami, the Pacific white that we look at. They're the preferred species. That's a lot of shrimp. As you see in the lower panel, many of these can be grown in ponds. There are oftentimes some that are grown indoors in very clean facility, but in either case, you wanna produce a shrimp that now can be go straight to market for people to do whatever they're going to do with it. Now, what is the relationship between the sea urchin and shrimp? Other than this shrimp bisque that's being served inside the shell of an urchin, what is the relation? Actually, in the wild, there is none. 
they occupy different habitats and they occupy different niches for the most part. So the shrimp do their thing, the urchins do their thing. Can they be co-cultured? Well, we've already shown that when you put the two of them together, you've got a problem because the urchins, when held in captivity with the shrimp over time, will eat the shrimp, will capture and eat the shrimp. So you can't necessarily co-culture them together. But that takes us back, though, to our original question. Why did the shrimp like to eat the urchin egesta? The urchin poo. Is there something there that they desire, they need, they want? What's going on there? Why do they, why do they eat it? Well, to answer that question, we took a small experimental approach. Now, this is some of the formulated urchin diet that we produce. Again, it looks like spaghetti. We'll take that diet and we'll feed it to our sea urchins, as you see here in my hand right there. At that point in time, here's a picture of an urchin. They love these pellets. They'll wrap their spines and their tube feet. These are small appendages that they'll wrap around this food item. They'll bring it to their mouth. They have five teeth that'll simply consume, rasp and consume this entire food pellet over a period of an hour or so. So they love what we feed them. It goes straight into their system. And let me show you what the basic body plan of a sea urchin is. Here's the shell. And if you could see inside of a sea urchin, this is what you would see. This is the top of the urchin. We oftentimes call it the aboral side. And it's the aboral side because the bottom part is what we call the oral side. That's where the mouth is. So this mouth will be there to consume food. And basically, if you have a food item that comes up in that area, those teeth, and those teeth are harder than a human tooth. Those teeth can take and crunch up this particular food item and they go it, take it into the pharynx where it's modeled into a small sphere, a small sphere that's covered with mucus. That sphere then starts to move through the pharynx into the stomach. It moves into the stomach, continues to move in later on into what we anatomically refer to as an intestine. Ultimately, that material after it's digested, will move out of the urchin on this aboral side. Here's the anus. The material will come out. It doesn't float, so it simply sinks to the bottom where now it's available for whatever. Normally, we just clean it out by using siphons, but the shrimp have found that there's something else going on there. So that's the basic procedure. And the little pink things you see here are the gonads. That's what we're trying to represent there. Not much of a body plan. They have a gut. They have some gonads, and that's pretty much it for the inside of a sea urchin. Now, here is a close-up view of the sea urchin gut, and you can see all of these pellets. Now, since they're still inside the urchin, we call them digesta. It's not until they are removed from the urchin that we call them egesta, so slightly different scientific terminology there. But look at these little pellets. They're all about a millimeter in diameter and the gut will be packed with these. And ultimately this material will be in part digested and then released as a pellet. Now the process of digestion is gonna be an interesting one to look at because it looks like nothing happens to the pellets as you move through. Now let's look about the nutritional quality first of this particular pellet. Here's the urchin feed that we formulate. It's got a, about a 30% protein content. It has some lipid. It has some good carb. Ash includes some calcium and magnesium and everybody needs a little fiber. So this is the quality of the food that we are feeding to these sea urchins. After it comes out the other side, it's no longer food. It's the urchin egesta. Well, a lot of fiber there that wasn't digested. A lot of ash material is left over. A little bit of lipid, a little bit of carb, and some protein. So there is some nutritional value to what we are seeing in this egesta. It has nutritional value. Protein, lipid, and carb is there and can be obtained. 
but there's something more there than probably than just the protein, the lipids, and the carbs that are left over. If you take one of these little pellets and you are to put it under a transmission electron microscope, and that's a thin section where you can look in incredible detail, and were to look inside of one of these pellets, you will see all of these bacteria. It's packed, absolutely packed with bacteria. Uh, you have different bacilli types, you have coxy, you have vibrios and such, many of which are undergoing active metabolic processes and many of which are dividing. So they're growing. And we have found in our Egesta that up to almost 70% of the area of a pellet ends up being bacteria. So when the food goes in, the pellet's mostly food. When the pellet comes out, it's mostly bacteria. And those bacteria presumably digest the food and then release good things for the sea urchin to use. Amino acids, simple sugars, fatty acids and such, perhaps nucleotides, other components that the urchin can use. And then all of these, this material is going to be lost when it, it moves out of the urchin into the water. Now we know everything about we know a lot. I shouldn't say everything. We know a lot about these bacteria. We've characterized them fully here. We know what's there, the species that are there, and that gives us an advantage to try to see what they might be doing for the sea urchin itself. But knowing that, and knowing that there is nutritional value, and knowing that there are bacteria there, many of which are alive, and now you should start thinking in your mind, wait a second, are these like probiotics for the most part? Are these bacteria themselves going to have some type of value? Well, we couldn't stand it. We had to find out what was going on. So we set up some supplementation experiments to see whether or not there was some value, nutritional value in those egestia, those sea urchin leftover poo pellets, as it was. We took 20 gallon aquaria, just like the aquaria you might have at your house. Inside of those aquaria, we would have a basket that would float. The basket was perforated. We could put sea urchins in this basket and feed those sea urchins the pellet. And the basket is floating. You can see the water level here and here's the standpipe and such. So this is one tank based on my cartoon. Here's another tank right here. So we either had urchins that we fed the urchin diet, which produced the urchin poo, which was then released to the shrimp. Keep in mind, the urchins are now separated from the shrimp. We don't have to worry about the urchins eating the shrimp. They can't get to them. But the poo can get down in there as, just as well. So we had some aquaria that had baskets that had nothing in them. There are controls for the most part. And we would feed these shrimp commercially based feed rations. So we purchased shrimp feed, some of the highest quality shrimp feed you can get. We either gave the shrimp a full ration of food, 100% knowing we'll get maximal growth for those shrimp. Or we cut that ration to 60%, meaning it was going to be subsatiation, less food available to them. And we went as low as 20% on the ration. For those where we had urchins in the basket, we also supplemented the urchin poo, obviously, or maybe I should say the urchin poo supplements the feed. We had some that received a full ration of feed, 100%, 60%, 20%, or nothing. Sometimes we fed the shrimp nothing. All they got was the, the urchin poo that came from the urchins being fed. So keep in mind, both sections got all the same amount of really high quality shrimp feed, but only these urchins got a supplement of urchin poo to see what, see what would happen. This is a graph that kind of depicts some of what we're trying to, to show here. This is shrimp weight gain after eight weeks. So we started with a shrimp that weighed about 70 milligrams. This is a small shrimp, a very, very small shrimp. And we grew it for about eight weeks. And this scale here shows you how many grams the 
the animal would gain. So within eight weeks, going from something that's just a few milligrams in size, you know, no more than a quarter inch or a, a half inch in length, we went to an optimal size. And it makes sense what we're seeing. If you feed the shrimp a full ration, this is going to be its maximal growth. Feed it at 60%, it's a little bit less. Feed it 20%, it's a little bit less. They all grew. They all look pretty good and such, uh, but it's what we would have predicted. Now, let's take a look at what happens if you just feed the urchin poo and no shrimp feed at all. Oh my goodness, they grew as well as those getting the best sea urchin feed, excuse me, the best shrimp feed out there. Shrimp feed versus just urchin poo much higher quality in terms of nutrients, much lower quality perceived as nutrients, but we have live bacteria there as well. They did just as well. This was incredible, but we don't stop there. Look what happens when you have urchin poo with a 20% ration, a 60% ration, a 100% ration. Now, when you add the supplement of poo, you can almost double, almost double the growth potential of the shrimp being fed those two components. This shocked a lot of people in the industry right here. I had one prominent scientist call me and tell me that you've just shown that the genetic potential of shrimp is much greater than we thought it was. That means the ability to grow a bigger shrimp faster is there. We haven't reached that potential yet maybe the answer is going to be in some of that material that we feed these animals here. But this is incredible to see, to see what has happened when you add this material in there. And I was told, I was given a call by someone from Europe the day we released some of this information. And they told me that for a period of time during that day, there were over 9,000 blogs that cited our study as what was going on in shrimp. It was so important that they told me that it was the top news story over all the world news for the day, uh, for that time period. So we thought we were pretty proud of ourselves in that, okay, we, we made the news. I don't know how many people watched it, but somebody did. What's next? So where do we go from here? Well, obviously we're interested in, at some point in time, perhaps commercializing this integrated multi-trophic aquaculture. We're now feeding the urchins. We can grow shrimp. Maybe we can order or put in some additional extractive species. Maybe the scallops can be used. Maybe certain seaweeds can be put in here. We can use more than two species. We can do three, we can do four and such. It's a component we need to evaluate and look at very carefully. Now, what else can we do? Well. We've shown now that the food that's out there right now in the industry is not good enough. There are other components that can be added. So feed improvements can come along such that we can take small shrimp, and then I'm giving the example of the shrimp, but I can replace this with fish or any other crustacean or any other cultured organism out there, going from a small organism to a much larger. Can we improve the feed to that extent? Well, let's talk about that a little bit. If we look at aquaculture, and I want to pay attention to this upper panel, this upper right-hand panel right here. This represents the tons of capture fisheries. That means going out in the ocean and fishing for fish, like you see these large boats do, and bringing them back. For the last couple of decades, that's been, that, that reached a maximum plateau. There's no more. Right now, the oceans provide a specific, a certain amount of food, but it's not going up and it may in some cases be going down. So the blue represents where aquaculture has picked up, has picked up the, the pace here, and now food production can increase because of aquaculture. But this aquaculture is because we have components in the feed that allow the animals to grow well. The principal component is fish meal. Fish meal is used in the aquaculture industry and accounts for 60 to 70 percent of the world fish meal that is actually produced. Now, the rest of this actually probably goes into companion animals like your dogs and cats and other animals as well. But aquaculture takes on a huge amount of the fish meal. 
shrimp feeds account for 20 to 30 percent of all of the fish meal that's used and if you look at this and I know this is a little bit older but we're already past two thousand dollars a ton for fish meal so it's disappearing there's not as much left it costs a lot of money we need alternative proteins to replace fish meal so that we can grow more effective shrimp other fish other different animals that are part of the aquaculture and maybe even terrestrial animals as well. So fish meal is currently being replaced in many cases by sometimes by squid meal. It can be by other products like casein, poultry byproducts, corn gluten. There's a numerous commodities out there that produce protein and I've seen probably 50 different protein sources used over the years to try to replace fish meal as a protein source in the diet of things like shrimp feed. You can use plant sources. Soybean meal is okay, cottonseed meal is okay. They're fine, but there's a lot of there's a lot of economics behind any of these particular products. And then there's this new product out here. It's called single cell proteins. Now single cell protein basically is a microorganism. It can be a fungi, an algae, yeast, or bacteria. Look at that word bacteria right there. I'm coming back to that one. But keep in mind, that's what we were feeding the shrimp a little earlier. So single cell protein sources might be of value to us and should consider those as feed ingredient sources and when we make the type of diets that are necessary. Let's look a little bit more at these single cell proteins. They have a high nutrient content, high quality. They're cheap. You can select the type you want they're environmentally sustainable. I'm just going to pay attention to this column right here. Bacterial single cell protein. Look at the amount of protein that's there. 50 to 65 percent. A minimum amount of fat, a fair amount of nucleic acid, which is an actual good growth promoter. This is chock full of protein. These bacteria are full of protein. And if you can ferment bacteria and grow them in quantities, not a pound, not two pounds, not a ton, but in thousands of metric tons, then you have something that's of value to the industry. It'll be a value to the aquaculture industry, to production animals, to companion animals, dare we say humans potentially in the future. So these type of single cell proteins have some really large value, we think, coming up in the future. We did a quick study with the, with the shrimp to look at SCPs, and we did this about a year or two ago. We evaluated the role of a bacterial-based SCP in feed intake. Now, we were interested in feed intake because if you put a protein into a diet and feed it to an animal and they don't want to eat it, you're wasting your time. So you want to know whether or not when you include something like a single-cell protein, something like a bacterial protein, when you include it in someone's diet, are they going to want to eat it? Keep in mind, the shrimp love those urchin pellets. Here we took just the pure, just the bacteria themselves, and we asked several questions. Will these SCPs affect feed intake? Will they affect growth? Will they affect the quality of the, the nutrient and market value of the component? Just to show you some pictures of how we do these particular studies, there's Karen Jensen. She did her master's thesis on some of this work. Here's a series of aquaria right here. These are all 20-gallon aquaria. We have several racks of these. She would take basically food pellets that we prepared and pour them down a tube in the aquarium onto a black plate. Yes, this is sophisticated science right here. A tube delivering food to a plate. That food was in pellets that we counted. We knew exactly the weight of those pellets. We knew how many we put in there. And off, as soon as you put the pellets in there, here comes the shrimp. The shrimp would come in there and begin to eat the pellets and consume every pellet that we have. And here's some additional photographs. This was a very time and labor intensive process. A number of students participated. You can see all the aquaria here. You would put the pellets in the tank and see how fast they ate them. So everybody had a stopwatch, and every three minutes they were counting pellets left. 
And we were able to determine that usually within a 30 minute period, every pellet we put in there was gone. The shrimp loved them. In fact, the shrimp would consume the pellets with the bacteria, the probiotic, if you want to call it that, the single cell protein, if you want to call it that, they would basically, they would consume it faster than one containing fish meal. Fish meal is the gold standard. It is the gold standard. Yet the bacterial SCP was preferred. They consumed it first. What did we find? Shrimp were absolutely attracted to the diets containing the bacterial derived SCP sources. There's something there they like, something there that made them attractable. Shrimp gained weight equal or better than those fed fish meal. Bingo. This is a big deal. No more fish meal was needed. We used a bacterial based SCP. The shrimp themselves had a higher protein and fat content when they were fed this bacterial derived SCP. Oh my goodness. That's a higher quality shrimp. More, it's bigger. It's got more protein in it. It's got more fat in it. And this is good fat. This is not bad fat. This is good fat. All of these components came when you fed it bacteria derived SCP. And by the way, these bacterially derived proteins are all produced from waste products, agricultural waste products, ethanol production waste products. These things can be used in fermentation facilities to grow massive quantities of single cell proteins cheap. They're cheap. They're sustainable. We're using a waste product to make these. And what happens? We feed them to the animals and they love them. And they grow well on them. They do fantastic. This is incredible. We're really pleased at this point with what we see. Uh-oh, teaser alert. We also work with zebrafish, one of the top biomedical models in the world. Number three at NIH for under trying to understand the human condition is the zebrafish. We did similar studies with the zebrafish that we're just now completing. We have been feeding fish instead of the fish meal, single cell protein, bacterial derived protein. Fish grew well. They grew as well or better than they did on fish meal. Again, the gold standard. But here's what we started to see. The females were not near as fat when we were fed single cell protein. 30% decrease in overall adiposity in females. Same size for the most part, but they had more lean matter. Leaner female, less fat. Males, we had a similar trend, but the decrease in fat was only about 15%. Still, that's 15% less. What else happened? We did a process called RNA-seq, where you look at the genomic, uh, the genomics of the fish uh, as they've consumed these particular products. SCP led to a downregulation of cholesterol synthesis. It led to an up, led to an upregulation of cholesterol transport. Basically, it's getting rid of cholesterol. The cholesterol levels apparently were going to be very low in these particular fish. Basically, this material is acting identical to a statin, like a Lipitor or a Crestor or some of these other statins. The product itself had statin-like qualities. This seems to be a much healthier fish. They reproduce fine. They do fine. They look very healthy. We need a lot more work to do right here, but it looks like SCPs have added, added value more than just the protein they carry, but there's some components there that are causing fish, shrimp, potentially sea urchin and such to be healthier, to live better and such. What does this mean if we translate this to other animals or should we say also to humans? Could it be in the future you were going to go to McDonald's and order an SCP burger? Possibly. What does this mean though for other type of other type of potentially disease and such? Can we promote healthy aging? I mean, if we can decrease adiposity and increase lean matter, that's a big deal, particularly for sarcopenia in aging adults, where sarcopenia is an is a big issue. What if we can preserve 
muscle tone, muscle function and such based on the diet. Should we feed SCP to humans or should we look at SCP and see if there are components that might be of value to the humans? Something's going on there that's really important that I think we've got to look at. It's potential involvement in, in wound repair. What about immunocompetence? I think we're going to find that the competency of the immune system in animals is going to be greatly enhanced when they're fed these type of components. That's going to lead to an understanding of the gut-brain axis because mental health is largely due to what goes on between the communication of the gut and the brain. And if the gut is going to be transformed by consuming components like bacterial SCPs, then the brain could potentially be transformed. We're wide open at this point in time because there may be ties between what we're seeing in basic aquaculture to human health. And this last little tidbit, I always like to talk to people about it. We're not taking chickens and cows to Mars. Sorry, they probably won't fit. But we may be able to take bacteria and grow bacteria and produce bacteria or fungus or other comp or other material that can serve as a protein source. We simply have to go to Chris Hastings over hot and hot and have him prepare something. Whatever he did, I'm sure it'd be good and we could eat it on our trip to Mars or, and beyond that. The last thing I note I wanted to leave with you was something that's going on right now at the UN. Uh, on the 23rd of this month, there will be a convening of the UN Food Systems Summit. They've decided, and this is was written up in the published in the Nature magazine. They have decided that there's not enough attention being paid to aquatic foods. These feeds are healthy. They're healthy. They need to be consumed. They've been neglected by researchers. They've been neglected by policymakers. Fish are not just a source of protein. They're an irreplaceable source of micronutrients and protein. There needs to be a greater attention because this is going to be the food of the future. It's something we need to pay attention to. I wanted to bring that to your attention as something that's going on. So for that, for the most part, we're finished and I wanna give Thanks to our funding agencies. I want to appreciate the NORC, who contributes greatly to a lot of what we do, the Nutrition Obesity Research Center here at UAB. Uh, some of our funding provided by the National Institute of Health and the National Science Foundation. And it takes a group of people, dedicated individuals to work. And I've had, I've been so fortunate to have so many good students and other faculty and such who've worked with us in this program for a number of years. They continue to work with us. We appreciate their efforts. We hope they're having fun. And at this point in time, I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Well, Dr. Watts, fantastic information that you provided us. I'm gonna start with this question because you just referenced the black plates. If those pellets are beneficial to shrimp, would they also be beneficial to other sea life? Sea life, well, normally if you're in a, in the pond, there's not any other sea life. There's only shrimp. But so you wouldn't feed these out in the ocean per se. Uh, but could other could other organisms benefit? Absolutely. I think I think the microbes we're adding are something that animals have eaten for years and consumed. We in our society are clean. We don't want to eat anything with bacteria or fungus on it. But in fact that might be a healthy alternative for us to consider. I'm not saying go out there and throw a piece of hamburger outside and let it, you know, spoil on you and then eat it. I'm not, I'm not trying to say anything like that, but I'm saying we have to look more closely at some of these other components to look at their value. So do the shrimp that you study grow in bear tanks or are they provided with structures or cover? Cause this person has a freshwater shrimp and notice the difference in growth depending on available cover. Uh, Shrimp will oftentimes seek cover because they don't want to be eaten by another shrimp or by another type of animal. So we haven't done any work that shows a synergism between cover of the organism and uh, and growth rates or anything along those lines. But like, like a lot of the fish that we work with and such, if I put cover in a tank, they go for it. Have you looked at the microbiome of the shrimp with and without urchin ingestia? And do you know which bacteria 
is responsible for the increase in weight gain in the shrimp? Uh, you've already just, you just outlined one of our grants we recently submitted <laughs> to the USDA as well. So we're hoping they'll fund us and be able to look at that type of work. Uh, we are starting to look at the type of bacteria that are there and what might be the pluses and minuses. I don't think it'll be any one bacteria. I think it'll be a, a, a group, uh, possibly a phyla, uh, maybe more than one phyla that are going to be involved here uh, in it. So it's something we absolutely want to look at. This attendee read about the black soldier fly larva as a protein source. Are SCPs superior to the black fly protein source? Well, we have to make sure I'm not going to badmouth any protein source because the way things are going to continue to go in this world, all sources of protein, whether there's something we eat as humans or something that we need to then prepare and feed animals, production animals, uh, companion animals, whatever, any source of protein is good. Black soldier flies are valuable. Insect proteins are something we need to be able to consider and such. They're kind of labor intensive and such. And there are some other issues with black soldier fly in terms of fat content or, or whatever. So uh, I, I think they bring something valuable to the table, uh, but I equally think if, if not more that SCPs may have even greater value. So did you notice a difference in water quality, specifically nitrate, nitrite, ammonia concentration in the polyculture systems versus when the species are cultured separately? Oh your ammonia and your nitrite, nitrate levels are, are gone, basically in, the, in, these, in these situations. Uh, particularly when we have algae or, or seaweeds and such within the system, they, have, they absorb it all. So yes, there is a, the nitrogen is being sequestered. That's the issue. If you have one species, they'll sequester X amount of nitrogen. Add another species, they'll sequester more nitrogen. That nitrogen is no longer available to pollute. Everything we eat seems to taste like chicken. So do SCPs taste like chicken? You know, I have to admit, I haven't eaten it yet. And, uh, you know, I, I will probably at some point in time. Uh, SCPs, again, are fermentation products. They dry them to a powder. So if you were to look at it, it looks like black sand. But I can take that black sand and I can put it in culture media and I can grow bugs from it, bugs or bacteria from it, I, I should say. So uh, there was probably some value there. I personally haven't tried it, but every animal we fed it to has done very well on it. So uh, at some point in time, we'll probably bite the bullet and, and uh, make a hamburger patty or something. Now, one person is going total preparation on this. Should the shrimp gut, the vein, be removed before we eat the shrimp? Before you eat it? Yes. Uh, it doesn't have to be. The transit time in a shrimp is usually about 45 minutes. From the time they eat something to the time it comes out the other end is about 45 minutes. And most of the time they're eating microalgae and or other components or some things from that are that aren't really bad. You may get a little sand or dirt in there, but it won't hurt you to eat the vein. But I know a lot of people like to pull them out and get rid of them because they don't exactly look very appetizing. You can take them out, that's fine. But if you forget, you're not gonna hurt yourself. And since we're up against the clock, one more question. How important is the water, the water quality? Is it fresh water, salt water, filtered water? What goes into everything? Well, in our laboratory, we have to be careful with the water we use. So in the old days, I could take tap water. That's not possible anymore. At this point in time, we'll take our water. We run it through an RO. We run it through uh, charcoal filters, uh, mechanical filters, we run it through cation anion exchange resins and such. We clean up the water pretty doggone clean and then fortify it with salt. So we'll put an artificial sea salt or a synthetic sea salt in there. But we have to start with really clean water so that we can make sure that we don't have any other components, unnecessary toxins that might have come in with municipal water. Well, Dr. Watts, thank you so much for taking time to be part of tonight's webinar. It's been great having you with us. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. For those in attendance, a recording of the webinar will be made available on our website tomorrow. And be sure to join us for our final installment of our The Science Of series. On October 12th, Dr. Holly Wyatt will uncover the truth 
about why we crave certain foods as a part of the science of cravings, why you crave and how to stop. You can also take a look back at previous webinars in the series at alumni.uab.edu slash video. Now, coming up, we also have a couple of other webinars that might interest you on October 26. Join us for Head Trauma and Brain Health, Protecting the Mind for Years to Come. Dr. Suzanne Judd will show us how we can make sure our brains stay healthy as we age. Then on November 2nd, be part of From Ash to Flooding, Our Changing Environment, as we look at the world around us with Dr. Jeffrey Wycliffe. We'll tailgate with us this fall on the rooftop of the Southern Kitchen and Bar. Single game alumni tailgate passes are available for only 50 bucks. These passes include food, drinks, and more. And yes, that picture you see is an image from where we will be up top overlooking the stadium. Find out more or purchase a tailgate pass. Just visit alumni.uab.edu slash alumni tailgate. Also get game day ready with a 2021 spirit box or a set of game day buttons. Spirit boxes are only 40 bucks and include a commemorative football, green EFEL, ever faithful, ever loyal shirt, 22 ounce cup and a magnet. That's a hundred dollar value for $40. Or you can visit our website to get your set of game day buttons for only $15. Fundraise from that will support Blazer Kitchen and students experiencing food insecurity on campus. Visit alumni.uab.edu slash spirit box. Looking for a podcast to listen to at home or on your commute to and from work? Listen into the UAB Green and Told podcast. Episodes are released every other week and feature members of the UAB community. Listen on the Apple Podcast app and Spotify or visit alumni.uab.edu slash green and told. Stay on top of everything alumni on social media. We're found by searching UAB alumni on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter on LinkedIn. Just search UAB alumni career community. And if you want more information about the National Alumni Society, visit alumni.uab.edu or email us at alumni at uab.edu. Once again, thank you all for joining us, especially Dr. Stephen Watts. Have a great evening. And as always, go Blazers.